Alex. What's going on? How are your weekends going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Good, good, good. I well, traditional hours. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I've got nothing prepared, so fire away on any questions. I was just going to say I went swimming today. <laughs> <It's> nice. <laughs> Today is certainly a good day for swimming. I felt like I went swimming. I was outside for about three minutes of assembling a wood rack and uh, was completely covered in sweat. Yeah, it didn't take long today. No, no, not at all. Well, uh, questions from anyone? Christy, you go ahead if you got anything because I, I, I don't have anything off the bat. I don't have anything prepared. Um, I could find something. Wait a minute. Feel free to source anything from homework or give me any, you know, what I, did we do during class last week or anything like that? I was looking at the homework just before this started and the full stack numbering. Yep. I, uh, I recall what that was about. Um, the order of everything happens in the chat, full stack chat app. Yes. Um, is the comment full stack code also in the chat app code? No, I think that was in the ad server code. Let me confirm that. I'm going to open up my files just to see. Yeah, so assignment 52, which was week 16, day three, that was all in the ad server. Um, and I linked to the two JS files that we use there as well. Um, so 52 is about commenting full stack code kind of top to bottom. And then the other assignment, which is... Um, 54 is all about um, the numbering of the chat app. That clarifies. Thank you. I'm opening the files now to see where I'm at with it. Um, I, I I actually have that up, so I'm just looking at it real quick. Um, Hey, everyone. Hey, Larry. Welcome to the hey, party. Just hanging out as people are sourcing uh, questions. So if you have any, feel free to throw them my way. We're okay. So it looks like I also put some numbers in the add uh, full full stack add app. 
Yeah, and 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 numbering them is completely fine in the ad app as well. Um, it's just the homework for the ad app is more, hey, let's read this code from top to bottom and make sure we understand what it's doing. The um, chat app is more of a, hey, let's understand the order that this code is running, which is certainly not going to be, you know, from the top to the bottom. Um, and so that's kind of the the uh, difference in those assignments. One is, hey, in the slightly smaller code base, let's understand what this code is doing, as opposed to the the chat app, which is, hey, let's understand when this code is running. Are we going to do something else with the chat app? We are. We are certainly not done with the chat app. So um, heading into next week, we are going to um, start using SQL in our chat app. And then we are going to learn about an object relational mapper, which is called an ORM. Um, and we're going to learn about how we can model our data from our ERD and also store our messages that way. Um, so we've got two more iterations that we're going to do on the chat app, and then we move into another full stack project in which we'll go over from scratch and do all the pro project setup again. Okay, I have a question. Um, sure, go for it. Uh, okay, so on the uh, on the chat app on the back end. Um, there's like a one through six. Um, I just want to ask about, so it's just like a brief overview. Um, cause I, I remember, but I don't. So I see like const express equals require express. And then it says const server express. Yep. Can you, you know, explain and then it, then it has cores and then it has body parser. So can you can you talk about those six lines? I sure can. Um, okay, so what we do is whenever we see require, require is just like um, on our front end. Let me see if I can share. Um, so on our front end code we're kind of used to seeing this import, right? Either we import the whole file or we pull something in from another file so that we can use it. So the, the clearest example of this is React. And what we're pulling out of React is our use state and our use effect, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing is kind of true on our backend with our, um, our uh, requires. So our requires are just another way that we can import um, import uh, things from our NPM packages. So require right here is saying, hey, we NPM installed Express. Express is a framework for Node that makes it easier to build APIs. So that gives us access to this variable called Express up here, which is why it's in a const. But now we have to use that Express. We have to set up an Express server. And so what we do is we call it with empty parameters, and that gives us our actual server. OK, now that we've got our server, there are two additional NPM packages that we want to use. One is called cores, which is cross-origin requests something. Um, and cores is what allows us to have requests from localhost 3000 to 3001 not automatically be blocked by our server. It is a cross origin because the origin of our request is coming from 3000, but it is crossing over to 3001. And that is why we need cores. So we pull cores in from NPM, just like we pull cores, uh, like we pull express in using require from NPM. But just like line two, we've got to actually use cores. So when we require cores, this is coming from NPM and it's storing it in cores here. Now we've got to actually link it in and tell the server, which is our express server from up here, hey, actually use this cores package that is coming in. 
And then same goes for body parser. Body parser is what is taking our JSON body and parsing it out into an object that we can use. And so what we do is we pull body parser in from NPM and we store it in body parser. And then we tell the server, which is our express server up here, hey, actually use body parser and the kind of the body coming in is JSON. Did okay. that answer your question or give you more clarity? Yes. Um, can you, you can, you said NPM, what does that stand for? Node package manager. Okay. And node package manager is literally a package is just a bunch of JavaScript code. Someone else has written for you. So uh, a package could be something uh, as big as express, which is a whole framework, or a package could be something as simple as I was so lazy. I didn't want to add two numbers together. So I installed an NPM package that added two numbers for me. Oh, really? And an, an NPM package could be as short as five lines of code or as long as 500,000 lines of code. And so with us using the 3000 and then the 3001, and we put our code in the 3000 and then it goes, goes through and comes back out on the 3001, why would the server block that? Because they're not, so the browser by default will only respond Mm. The, 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 so cores is usually, let me take a step back. Cores is usually set up to block requests on different domains. So if I'm on google.com and I want to make an API call to the New York times.com by mm. default, the New York times is going to block that and say, no, no, only websites on the New York times.com can access our API ending in newyorktimes.com. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that because we have to run our front end and back end on two different ports, mm -hmm. Cores is stepping in and blocking that. And it's saying, no, no, 3001 is a totally different website than 3000. You're not allowed to access information on different, different ports. And so that's why we've got to tell um, Express hey, it is okay, we're setting up an API here. APIs are all about being able to access information no matter their domain or the port. And so that's why we kind of bypass cores here and we mm -hmm. say cross origin requests, which is the COR, um, are allowed because we're setting up an API server here. So by default, it just blocks everything, but these two lines of code or what it's are is black. is telling Express? Yeah, it it is okay. We are expecting requests to come in from different ports. Okay, so cores is a not blocker, not a blocker. Cores blocks by default, and these two lines of code are unblocking the cores. Okay, okay, so it's un. Okay, I got it. Unblocking. Yes. Okay, so now because okay, so because we're making the messaging app and we're using localhost 3000 and we're using localhost 3001 if we weren't in the i guess class environment and we were using both of these would lo would localhost 3000 be my phone and then localhost 3001 be your phone localhost 3000 would be mywebsite.com Mm -hmm. And 3001 would be api.mywebsite.com. So you would still have two separate URLs. The front end would be where you went in the browser to actually, you know, load your website up. Mm -hmm. The API URL would be deployed to a server. So that would be deployed to Heroku or AWS or Google Cloud Platform or any of those things. And we would still have a slightly different domain for that, 
but that domain would never be accessed by the end user. That domain would just be used in your front end code. So, so you're going to learn messaging. So the, the back end is responsible for keeping track of all of the messages. The front end is just an interface for people to send those messages. So, so this is not about really messaging somebody. It's showing us how, when we put a message in, how it works its way through to the server. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we, we haven't quite gotten into user authentication and how we keep track of who's sending what message. Um, we, we will get into that um, probably towards the end of this week, this upcoming week, if not next week, of how do we build a login page? How do we deal with user authentication? And then how do we, how do we keep track of who posted what? So we're also, we're probably gonna do like a little mini Facebook page where people can make a post and see who posted it. And then other people can go in there and make a comment and see their name show up next to the comment. Okay. So once we're done with the chat app, we'll probably get there of making a basic little login page, making it so someone can make a post and then other people can comment on it. So we're, we're working our way up there. Give me one second. I'm going to grab my tea and I will be right back. So hopefully okay. you guys have questions when I come back. Give me two minutes. So. Huh. Yeah, I have questions because I got more. <laughs> You got good questions. Keep going. Huh? You got good questions. Keep going. I know, right? Break, break it on down. Break it on down. So, yeah. I, so, it, okay. So, I'll ask you guys this. So, it, on my front end, I have 28 lines of code. And then on my back end, I have, well, I'm on server.js. Thirty-two. Now, after he explained that, now I'm wondering about these numbers because I'm trying to find the one. My, mine are roughly the same length. Just with yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I'm a, I, now that I know more about Express and Course and the Body Parser. I'm a little, let's see. Okay, I'm back. Any other questions? Okay, so I got more questions now. All right, so based on what you listed before we left. Yep. Or A, okay. Yep, part A, part B. Part A is getting the message. Part B is kind of handling when a new message comes in. So when we, okay, so when we get the message, I'm just trying to see when, okay, so at the where the con where you just explained where the express and the cores and the body parser and then like the import that's all kind of that's all kind of back end setup right, right? so uh -huh. that that code runs the second we type in npx node mon all of that code runs so what happens is let me pull that wait wait, wait 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 so you're saying uh on the front end the imports and then on the the back end on the cons on the cons when we run the um node mon that makes those those line was five on one and six on the other that that makes those 11 lines run so what happens when we go in our back end and we say npx node mod right if mm -hmm. i hit enter here 
what would happen is it would go through here and it would be like express NPM. I got it. What do you want to do with it? Oh, <laughs> you want to use that to make a new server. Got it. Oh, you want to pull in cores from NPM. I got it. Oh, you want ex uh, express to use that cores. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pull body parser in from NPM. Oh, you're sending some JSON in. You want to parse that out. We got it. Okay. What about messages? Messages is just an empty array. No idea what's going on with this empty array, but when you need to reference it, I know it's an empty array. Okay, what's next? Oh, if someone goes to localhost 3001, we're going to we're going to send this back. But no one's gone to localhost 3001 yet, so we ignore the whole this whole line. Same thing down here. Oh, if someone makes a get request to messages, we know we're going to do this, but we're going to we're not going to run that code until that API call comes in. Same with this post. And then we finally make it down here. And all of a sudden, the, the server is like, oh, Express, listen for 3001. And once you're running on 3001, console log out API run. So this line is what is telling it, hey, hold up be prepared for a get request to the the root route or a get to messages or a post to messages so what we are listening for is a post a get or another get to these routes we are listening for these three requests and once it hits this code it kind of goes in waiting mode because what it is doing is it's listening for those endpoints to actually be called. Okay. Pausing there for questions before I switch over and do the same thing in the front end. I was going to ask, where does it go from there, um, from the listening part? Yeah, so the back end is done at this point. The back end is kind of in a holding pattern until those endpoints get used. And that's a very common thing for any kind of API server is it turns out that once it does the setup code, which is one through eight, and once it is told, hey, listen, which is 32 through 35, all of this code is essentially ignored until the front end makes the request. So all of this doesn't really get run until the front end asks, hey, I've got a request to get the messages, or hey, I am posting a new message to the express to the to the server, at which point it runs all of the code in here. So are there any more back end specific code questions before we switch to the front end? Nope. Hmm. I can't think of any. Okay. Wayne is here, and so is uh, uh, Doug. I had I had one question on the back end. Max. Yep. Go for it. Um. So the the top one, the get slash at the root route. Yes. yes. Um, that only gets called if you're explicitly calling the root route, not if you're calling a route that starts with the root like it doesn't also get called when you do slash messages correct okay thank you and you can test that if you add a console log in here that says root route hit and then you made your get request to messages because we never explicitly call this in the front end this would never console log out so even though we hit our messages and our posts to our message, this console log would never actually get run. And, it, and there are some times when you're like, I don't understand why is this not running? And I will just do a console.log hit. And I will see what hit comes out of my, my console in order to know, hey, did I screw something up here? You know, is the name not right? Is the problem in my endpoint itself or is it in the route of my endpoint? Um, and so sometimes adding in something like this is really helpful. So, Go ahead, okay. Chrissy. 
Nope. I, you know what? I, I was on the other page, so I'm going to wait for you to go over. To okay. Front end. Okay. So let's switch over to there. So in my front end, I'm in my app.js, right? So what happens here is all of this imports, right? This is saying, hey, let's get it ready. I need my CSS in here. I'm going to reference my header later on. I've got a couple different components that I'm referencing here. And I also use state and effect. Those have to come in from React, right? OK, great. Now what happens? Well, the code in here always runs um, when the app first sets up. So what do we do? We first say we need state. State is where, where we store our data. And whenever that data gets updated, React automatically updates our HTML for us, right? So remember in tic-tac-toe, we updated our array and the array had the X in it, but that did not mean the HTML got updated to show that X. What we had to do is loop over the array, generate out all the buttons again, put the X or O in the button, and then use inner HTML to update it. React is way easier than that. As long as we use state and we set the state properly, whenever we update our data, the HTML automatically updates for us and shows that data. So we have an empty array of messages, right? We just say, hey, we don't have any messages loaded yet. But when we do get the messages, we know there will be a list of the messages. And that's why we use the array here. Then what we do is we say, hey, the first time app shows up, which is what this empty array at the end does, whenever that the, the component first shows up, make this effect happen, the effect of loading in the messages for us. And so because it's asynchronous, we need to put it in a function and then call that function. And then what we do is we say, hey, go fetch localhost 3001. So this is why I have a one right here, number 17. This may include some spoilers for your homework assignment because mm -hmm. I did the homework assignment myself and made sure, hey, how many steps should you guys have when you go to turn in this assignment, right? Um, and so this code actually gets run twice. Um, but just to get it started, we say go to 3001. Now we are making a cross origin request to our back end, which is why we need cores on the back end to say, hey, heads up, there are going to be requests coming in from 3000, and that's OK. So now we pull the messages, but we get back this giant response, right? The response has the status code and the headers and the body and all kinds of information in it. So what we do is we say, hey, that response has some JSON in the body. That's all we really care about. But you notice I went from one to five. Well, where are two through four? That's all on the back end. Right. So now we got our JSON, we got our data. Our data actually has our messages that are stored in the server messages array. So what we do is we take that data now that the JSON has been parsed and we set it into the state. Well, because we set it into the state, the messages list is getting the messages from the state right up here. So messages list now wakes up and goes, oh, messages has changed. We need to update me messages list and list out all of the messages. So, OK, I got one question. For Only one? Yeah, right, on both sides. OK, so I'm noticing that there's, oh, wait a minute. Is that mine? Okay, I'm noticing like that there's so part A get message get messages and then there's a part A on the other side too. So everything above that is basically set up. Yes. On both sides. Yes. Okay. Okay, that was well. That's just the one. That was an easy one. <laughs> So 
All right. Nobody else has a question. I, I feel like I, I feel better, but I still feel. So the thing about backend, and I'll reiterate this in class tomorrow, it feels stupidly complicated until you understand it. And then you feel stupid for thinking it was complicated. Okay. It's one of those things where you're like, all right, if, I, if I'm getting the JavaScript syntax, right? If all of that stuff is making sense to me, now I kind of understand, hey, the front end is what the user's interacting with. And the back end is the thing that is empowering multiple users to interact on my front end. So that's the line of delineation, right? Of, okay, is this something that my end user is going to see? And if they're going to see it, that's in my front end code. But if multiple users are going to be interacting with that, that is when the data needs to flow from my front end into my back end. And my back end has to be prepared to not only receive that data, but to store that data and send it back to the front end. And that is when we start getting into our create, read, update, and delete. And so that's when our back end needs to be set up to do all those operations, but our front end still needs to do all of them. The difference is instead of doing it directly on the data in the front end, what it's doing is it's sending a request to the back end to go update that data, whether it's creating, updating, uh, creating, reading, updating, or deleting it. Once the, the backend does it, it's going to send some version of it back to the front end, and the front end is going to show it. So when it, when it switches from part A to part B, uh, okay, so part A is when we type in hello and then hit send. Nope. nope. Part A is I would like to see my messages app, please. So the app loads and it goes, oh, we need to go get any messages that have already been sent. It goes and it does that. It shows the messages in React and React and the server are now in a holding pattern. Both the front end and the back end are like, all right, Back end is waiting for the front end to request more data. The front end is waiting for the user to do something. So then what happens is we are in that holding pattern until the user types in hello and hit send. Now when they the user hits send on that message, the front end goes, oh, I've got a new message. I've got to go send that to the back end. The back end gets that message stores it in the messages array and sends back all of the messages and the response. The front end then gets that response and says, oh, now I've got all the messages. I need to loop through all of them and make them show up in messages list. And if you followed all of that, you've already got all the answers for your homework this weekend. And if you didn't, don't worry, this is recorded. <laughs> so, so, at, so Doug has his hand up. I'm a, I, I got to think for a second because I feel like my head is about to explode. Good, I'm teaching it right. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug. Um, uh, on the app.js, uh, where you said that the code in the use effect gets run twice. Um, Yes. Why does it run yeah. twice? It or only it runs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, it only runs twice. This is separate from your previous question, by the way. Of we had a console log in here, and you said, "Why is the console log running twice?" Right. That, mm -hmm. That's a separate answer. The okay. reason okay. why I have number seventeen in here is because for the homework assignment. I said, imagine the user opens the app, sends a message, then opens another tab 
goes to localhost 3000 again and wants to see all of the messages that got sent. So this is number 17 doesn't happen until the user opens another tab and reloads localhost 3000. Okay. So if the user opened the app and just sent a message, number 17 and everything after it wouldn't happen. The only reason this runs again is because they effectively opened the app again, just in another tab. And that's why all of these have two steps because this is number 17, number, number 16 and a half is the user opened another tab. And then, oh, it's another tab. We've got to reload all the data in the app. We do 17, we go do 18, 19, and 20 on the back end. Then we come back with the data on 21 in the front end and update it number 22 in the state in the second tab. Okay, thank you. The opening the second tab was the part I was missing. Yeah, and I mentioned that in the homework assignment. I say, hey, this is very basic, but assume the user opens your app, sends a message, opens another tab and wants to see the messages. And that is what you are trying to step out throughout the, through all the code. And that gets you to like 25 ish steps, depending on how thorough you're being. Thank you. I only got to 17, but okay. 17 is okay. I think I said between 15 and 30 in the, in the homework assignment it really depends how much you're breaking it down, right? Because when you're in something like, um, you know, it's not really a good example, but it, 17 is, is okay, Wayne, and send that in because I'll review that homework assignment and provide feedback of like, hey, you forgot, you know, steps 18 and 19, but that's okay, right? So um, if you feel like you did the whole assignment and you think you got every step, even if you're only at, 15 steps, go ahead and submit it. Now, if you you think you did the whole assignment and you're at eight steps, chances are you didn't break it down enough in, in order to make sure that you got all of them. But 17 to me is a close enough number um, that you may have hit all the important steps and that's okay to turn that in. Okay. Latonia, I'm curious on your... Um, your feedback on this, because while we did, we certainly did the, the chat app um, last cohort, I don't know that we did this homework assignment where we said number out the steps. So I'm curious as someone who has done backend apps now and understands the whole flow, your, your uh, viewpoint on all of this. Yeah, I do remember we did it once and it wasn't as detailed. Um, so I, I actually like that you're doing this. I think it's very helpful for uh, just having that, that full flow of the understanding between it. And I wanna say when we did it, it was only on one end. Remember we had like three or four, maybe even five iterations of our chat app. But when we did this particular assignment, it was only on either the front or the back. It wasn't, it wasn't both. Um, so I personally think it's great. I think the more exposure that we have, the better, the better it sticks, so. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and don't worry, we are working our way up to those other iterations of the chat app. So we will be doing at least two more iterations. And then when I get through those two, I'll probably find one more that I'll want to touch on. But um, we've probably got another two days in the chat app. Um, and then we're going to start working on, hey, can we do like, a, a, we won't call it Facebook, but we'll call, we'll, we'll come up with some, you know, monster name of, of Facebook or Twitter or something. So we can keep track of that. So me again. Um, so when we did uh, on the back end, we did, uh, what is it? We ran node mod. How do we run node mod? Is that what we put node? NPX for? node mod in the terminal. NPX node mod. Okay, and so I'm looking here now and it says to restart at any time. And then it says, it says it's watching paths and then it says watching extensions, JS, MJS, mm -hmm. JSON. Mm -hmm. 
So what is what what all of that is telling you is hey, we are watching any files that end in .js or M MJS or .json. And okay. we're watching those files to see if they change. And if they do change, we are pulling the plug on node and restarting it because that file changed. So it has it to restart at any time, hit enter, hit enter RS. So we could just hit RS in our own. Um... You could, but the whole point of Nodemon is that it's automatically going to restart for you. Oh, okay. Okay. And then what did we, I can't, it's not showing on here. What did we run on the front end? NPM start. And if someone reminds me at any point next week, I will tell you how to make NPM start work in our back end as well. Oh, why would we do that? Just so it's the same command so you don't mix them up between the front end and the back end. Oh, so we would be able to hit, hit that on either side and then it will, uh, it would just, okay. I would cover it now, but I think it's worth the whole class seeing it. Um, yeah. So I want to touch on that at some point next week, but it doesn't really matter, matter when. Hmm. Fifteen minutes left. Any questions you've got? Fire away. Um, in the back end code, in the both messages and message route. Yep. Where it's uh, response send messages. Um, that does that automatically get converted to JSON as it's sent to the front end? Yes. Okay. So the express just automatically does that. So we don't have to tell it. Correct. Yeah. You could do, I, I kind of did a little shorthand there um, because I knew I expressed it that for us, but effectively what it is doing is this. So I believe if you put that in and ran your code, um, it would still work exactly the same. That's just because the res.send is hitting this object in here when the json.stringify isn't in here. And Express is like, hold up. We can't send objects over the internet. The only thing that we can send over the internet is strings. And so we need to parse this out uh, in a way that can be sent as a string. And so what Express is doing under the hood is calling stringify uh, for us um, automatically. But yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Express just does it for us, so we don't need to explicitly do it ourselves. OK. Um, now, it does not do that for data coming in on the request. It does that for data going out with the res.send, but it will not automatically say, oh, there's a string coming in as JSON in the body. Let me parse that for you. And that's why we have to set up body parser. Got it. Um, also in the send, the, the curly braces around messages, that's saying put the array in an object. So there's an with a key value pair of messages in the array? Yeah, so what you could do is, um, let me see, I just learned I can share two windows. Let's see what happens if I do this. Can you guys see both windows? Yes. Yes. Mm, yes, but small. Okay. Um, yeah. You learn something new every day. This is why I don't normally share, um, I share my whole monitor instead of just sharing the, the windows. But anyway, what we could do is if we took this out, what it would do is it would send the messages back as a as the array itself, not the 
array in an object where the key is messages and the value is the array. So what we would have to do on our front end is instead of saying data.messages, it would literally just be data there. Okay. Um, and that would, I, I, that's a bad example. It was actually this endpoint, but this would work, right? Is now the, the response is just the array of messages. So on our front end, we just need to match that and not use a key. How, and, and this is completely valid. There's nothing wrong with it. However, my personal opinion is you get, get in the standard of sending back an object no matter what. So even um, not just for something like this, but in our res.send, we're just sending back a string here, right? We're not really sending back an object. That breaks my general rule of whenever I build an API, I always try and send it back in object form for consistency. So I would send something back like error false. And then I would say uh, something like um, message, welcome to my fancy API. And that, because we're sending it back as an object for consistency reasons, um, now everything that you get back from our API contains an object. That's a personal preference. That is not a, a rule that is not written anywhere. That is just what I prefer to do is send everything back as an object, um, but you do not have to. Um, the other benefit of sending everything back as an object is what happens um, when you realize, oh crap, I need to send back another piece of data. Well, now that you're sending back another piece of data, now you're forced to take the array that you're sending back and put that array in the object and then send back another key. Well, depending on what version people are running on the front end, because the front end is expecting the array and not an object, you run into some trouble there of, well, now there's an object and that array is still in it. But if the front end is expecting a straight up array, it's going to break compared to if you had an object that was sending it back and just added in another key, it wouldn't break. So it's, it's, it comes down to personal preference there. But when I build my APIs, I always try and send back the object that automatically gets converted as JSON instead of the data itself. Larry, did you have a question? Okay. Does anyone have a question? Hopefully we're taking the last couple hours of the weekend to like just let it sink in, right? It's going to take a while. The good news is like most of the concepts are done here. I know I keep saying that, but this is now we just get practice with all of these concepts. Um, we layer in a little bit of SQL that makes it just a tad bit more complicated. But after that, you guys have done full stack, right? And you guys have all the full stack concepts. So now we just do more and more projects to make sure that you understand it. And then Nathan comes in and helps you deploy it all. And then it's the end of the program. This is week 17 coming up, right? Yes. What, what does, um, I know we deployed, uh, last time we did, we did Git. So what are we going to put this on Git? Is that what that is? Yes. Well, you said something about Heroku, right? Heroku is the name of the service that you guys will use to deploy. Yes. So and Heroku will kind of host your app for you. But but this is a just so I'm clear, this is a one sided app. Define one sided. For, well, from what we said earlier, we're we're going, we're bringing it in, and then we're taking it to the back end and then to the server. So this is a full stack app because you've got a front end and a back end. Oh, so that's that makes. See, you, I get thrown off by messaging because I think of texting. So, wh how, what other context should I think of the messaging app is in? 
is so that a... think of it full full stack because it's got a front end and a back end. Right. Right. So we the front end is showing the stuff. The back end is taking care of the data that is showing up in the front end. So the back end is actually keeping track of the messages itself. So if your front end blows up and you restart the front end and the back end is still running, when you reload your front end, all of your data would be will still be there, right? Because it's pulling it from the back end every time it loads. So that's what you should be thinking of the context of, of full stack is data lives in the back end and we make requests to the back end and we send data to the back end and that keeps track of everything. So our front end, anytime that it sends data, anytime that it loads, it just asks the back end for that data and it pulls in. And then that's full stack? That's full stack. Now, the okay, reason maybe why- I, Maybe in my mind, I thought it was more. So maybe that's why I'm kind of like- I So we're gonna, add, we're gonna add in the database to the back end. So that will make it a little bit more full stacky because we are putting another layer on that stack. Um, right, which is going to be Postgres and, and all of that stuff. So we will add one more layer on top of that. But what the the weird concept to bridge is we're all on local host, right? So like, it doesn't really make sense of, well, what happens when I have multiple users using my website? And we can't really test that until we deploy it because localhost 3001 is just on our computer. So we can't really say, hey, all my fellow students go test my app and I'll see all the data that you're submitting because you haven't deployed it yet. But that is the reason why we need full stack is because a hundred different people could have your front end open and that's fine. And they're all a hundred different individual copies of your front end, but there can only be one back end because that back end is holding the data for the hundred different people who are using your app in the front. So whoever uses it, so if 10 people use it on the front end, it's all going to flush through the back end, like how we're making it do like the, our testing of us doing that. So, so if I had a, if I had my front end set up to where, uh, I don't know if this is possible, but it just, I was thinking about this. So uh, say like, I wanted to know how many carbs was in the food. Mm -hmm. So I would have it, I would have someone put in um, watermelon and then they would tell, that would tell them how many carbs. And then that information is going to pull from somewhere that I. In know, the back end, in the database, in the back end. So what's going to happen is the, the front end is going to have an input, right? And it's going to say, enter your food. And the user types in watermelon. So the watermelon, whatever they type in, gets sent to the back end. The back end goes, oh crap, I got to go to the database. And so it goes to the database and it says, show me watermelon. And it finds watermelon and it goes, watermelon has 50 calories in it. And so that number 50 gets sent back to the front end. Now the end user still hasn't seen the number 50. Now the front end just knows the number is 50. So now we build a React component or we set it into the state to say, hey, database found watermelon it's got an image of watermelon and it's telling you the calories is 50 calories you know per whatever serving hmm okay okay and if the front end crashes your server is still running so now when the user comes back and goes oh how many calories again was watermelon well, all of that data is still in your backend database. So, so okay, this is my—I swear this is my last question. So, like, <laughs> well, you got two my, minutes. When my Wendy's app crashed, then when I got it back up running, I just logged in with my login, and all my stuff was right there. That's that is an API. Okay, okay, okay. Wendy's app now. has an API. You placed an order, and when your app crashed. The restaurant's still making your food, right? They didn't want when your app crashed for your order to disappear from their screens. So what happens is you're in the Wendy's app and you're plugging along and, and you go into the menu to start the order API call. All right, first of all, we need to know what the Wendy's menu is 
so that you know what to order because God knows the Wendy's menu changes every three months, right? So API call happens. All right, now you get all the food and the prices and the customizations you can make, all of that one API call. Now, API doesn't give a crap about you until you build out your whole order on the front end and you go, I'm ready to order. So you punch in your credit card details, you do whatever else. Now you send that, you make an API call and you go, I want this food. And the API call goes through, places your order, sends it to the store, does all of that stuff and responds to your AP, to your app and goes, great, your order number one, two, three, pick it up in 15 minutes. Now your app crashes for whatever reason, or you lose cell service or whatever happens. Well, that data, when you did that order, when you placed that in and they told you you were order number one, two, three, they inserted that into the database. Okay, so now that it's in the database, it doesn't matter. You can quit your app. You can do whatever you want. When you reopen your app and check your order status, it's going to say, oh, we found order one, two, three in the database. Just because your app crashed didn't mean our database crashed. That information is still locked. That makes so much more sense. <laughs> Sometimes all it takes is a little fast food, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Wendy's can break it all down. No, the reason why I ask that is because my Wendy's, my McDonald's app has crashed. My Wendy's app has crashed. It's really, I've had that experience. And so as you're explaining this, okay. That's why we hold office hours. I hope this was, uh, I hope the people who weren't here watched this because this is very helpful. Very much so. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thanks for the good questions. Absolutely. All right. I will let you guys go. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Anything pops up, you know where to find me on Slack. Otherwise, I'll see you at 530 tomorrow. All right. Take Thank care, everybody. You. Are we Thank in person you. or um, out of um, virtual? Uh, good question. I think we're, let me pull up my calendar. Um, I'm actually going to be out of town most of August. Um, but I will obviously still be teaching um, other th than the week that Nathan comes back for DevOps. So I believe uh, I have to look at the other schedule to answer that question. There were no good deals on um on uh, portable monitors. I just want to put that out there. Uh, Amazon Prime days were a uh, disappointment. I got mine um, for about two hundred dollars with like the um, protection. They like two thirty. With what? I got one like Strange has with uh -huh. the protection from Amazon for like two thirty. It was like a buck eighty nine or something, and did the protection put it over in the tax like two thirty with the shipping and stuff. But that was what it was. Yeah, uh, that wasn't a deal price. That, that that's just deal. what they and I want. Look, I want the touch screen. <laughs> um, this is an in-person week on the schedule, Larry. So I will probably show up in person on Thursday, unless for whatever reason there is a different day that you would like me to show up on, and then I will be there then. Okay, I, I probably attend uh, virtually. I got a lot of stuff going on, so maybe show up Thursday when you come in. All right. Cool. Same, same here. Cool. So I'll shoot for Thursday in person. Um, the week of the 25th is fully virtual. Um, and then because I will be out of town starting on the 6th of August, I will probably be in person every day, the 1st to the 4th. Because that's when we start getting a little bit more, Hey, we've taught everything. We, we need want to make sure that you're progressing on your capstone. Gets a little bit more one-on-one -on -one oriented. We start backing off on three hours of lecturing and say, "Hey, what concepts do we need to touch on? Let's reiterate them and let's spend the rest of the the class time working on your capstone and touching on that kind of stuff." So, um, I will probably be in person, in person, uh, the first through the fourth of August. All right, sounds good. Uh, have a good night, everybody. You too. Good night. Good night. See you guys. Thank you.